palace of illusions chapter 20 vibes i didn't win all my battles my husbands took other wives hedamba kali devika balandara chitrangada ulipi karunamathi how naive i'd been to think i could have prevented it sometimes there were political reasons but mostly it was male desire i retaliated by locking myself up in my quarters refusing food and throwing expensive objects at my husbands if they dared to approach me my tantrums became almost as famous as yudhishthir's righteousness and over the year not a few songs were composed about my jealousy in truth i was not nearly as upset as i made out to be i was a practical woman i knew i couldn't expect my husbands to remain celibate while they waited for their turn as my spouse i knew also that i was special to them in a way that none of their serapy beauties the married little could ever be i'd been at their side when they were young and in danger marriage to me had protected them from the murderous worth of duryodhan i played a crucial role in bringing them to their destiny i'd share their hardship in khandav i'd help them design their unique palace which so many longed to see if they were pearls i was the gold wire on which they were strung alone they would have scattered each to his dusty corner they would have pursued separate interests deposited their loyalties with different women but together we found something precious and unique together we were capable of what none of us could do alone i finally begin to see what the wily kunti had in mind when she insisted that i was to be married to all of them and though they never made my heart beat wildly the way i'd hoped as a girl i committed myself totally to the welfare of the pandavas still it's never a good idea to let one's husband grow to complacent my displays of temper ensured that the pandavas continued to regard me with a healthy respect when i finally forgave them they were appropriately penitent it kept the number of their wives to a minimum and what was more important made the wives reluctant to visit the palace only once only once was i truly shaken when arjun chose subhadra krishna's sister as his mate and carried her away in a wildly romantic chariot race with the other brother the irate balram chasing after them after they were married arjun brought her to me so she could pay her respect he made her dress in a simple cotton sari but it didn't hide her translucent beauty her lips trembled with nervousness yeah she heard of the tantrums drops of sweat shone on her temples like a circle of pearls still nothing could dampen the drunken love in her eyes a look that was reflected on arjun's face he never looked at me like that way and never would a pang went through me remembrance of another man that i'd put away successfully for so long that i thought it was erased and though one part of me sympathized with subhadra's fear the other part raged that she had so easily and thoughtlessly gained what i in spite of all my renown as the chief queen of the pandavas would never possess and so i turned from her making deliberate cutting remark about seduction and betrayal until she was reduced to tears more than subhadra who after all owned me nothing more than arjun whose perfidies i was used to by now it was krishna i felt had betrayed me but when i accused him of having encouraged his sister to snatch arjun from me he was quite unbashed 
Arjun is not like a nose ring that someone can snatch from you, he said sternly. He comes and goes of his own will. Besides, you know that no matter whom else he marries, his commitment to you remains the same. But most important, out of their union will come a great warrior. And out of him will come a great king. He touched my shoulder, perhaps to lessen the harshness of his words. Isn't that more important than the brief heartache you suffer? Over time, I found myself becoming friendly with the wives. <laughs> this was aided by the fact that they all chose to remain with their own people in the kingdom of their birth. Distance is a great promoter of harmony. A fact that women who find themselves in a situation similar to mine should keep in mind. Surprisingly, Subhadra became my favorite. On her visit, she put up with my petty Chinese without complaint, bringing me water, combing my hairs, even fanning me on hot afternoons until I was shamed into desisting. Though no one could accuse her of weakness, she was more pliant than I. Perhaps that was why when tragedy fell upon us both, she would handle it more gracefully. In the years of my misfortune, she would take my sons into her home, treating them no differently from her own child, deftly balancing affection and discipline. I would love her for that, but no, she'd make her way into my heart long before. The mannerisms, the way she rise an eyebrow or burst into laughter or shook her head at a display of folly, or Krishna's and watching her made me feel that she was by my side. A decade passed thus, as in a dream, and as in a dream, I recall those years only faintly. The way one remembers the color of a serene sunset. It was always like this when life goes the way we want. My husband's and I grew older richer, more comfortable with our good fortune and with each other so that when at the end of a year I went from one bed to the next, it is no longer caused us awkwardness. Trade and industry and art prospered in our city. Our reputation spread across kingdoms. Our subjects flourishing blessed us in their prayers. We held in our palms all the things we'd once longed for. But deep down, though no one would admit it, we were a little restless, a little bored. The current of the destiny seemed to have flung us ashore and receded. Not knowing that it was gathering in a tidal wave, we chaffed in our calmness, wondering if it would ever claim us again. <laughs>